one of the forests that John's talking about is the early years of its practice. Talked about how his mind would progress and progress and progress, and then the whole thing would crash with nothing left. And then start progressing again. And that would crash again. We began to notice there was a cyclical pattern, the ups and downs. We learned to anticipate them. Particularly, you'd learn to anticipate the crashes. And the way he got around this was to decide not to pay any attention, to decide he wouldn't, didn't care whether it was progressing or regressing, he was just going to stick with his practice. In, case, in his case, it was repeating the word Bhutto. In other words, he decided he wasn't going to buy into the, the drama that had begun to infuse his practice. I had quite a narrative of how things would go up and then things would go down. And because he had bought into the drama, that just reinforced the pattern. The way it went out was not to buy into it. To have a more sensible attitude towards the whole thing. Whatever ups and downs they, there may be, you don't have to take them all that seriously. You just stick with your practice. This is part of finding the middle way between the extremes that the dramatic side of our personality likes to read into things. The Buddha had a similar problem. In his case, he started out with the extreme of sensual indulgence. And then in order to get away from what he saw as the problem of sensual indulgence, he went totally into self-torture. He was an extremist. If it wasn't extre one extreme, it was going to be the other. The kind of thinking that deals in large abstractions tends to push us to extremism. But thinking that likes to deal in drama goes in the same way as well. And so there's an ordinariness to the practice that sometimes we resist. It's like the poets and artists of the 19th century who despised the bourgeois. The bourgeois were prudent, sensible, and the poets hated them. There was nothing, there was nothing dramatic in their lives. Sure. Living a dramatic life can be pretty miserable. It makes for great art, but it's a miserable life. I read a novel one time in which a guy had been in prison for a murder. He was reading letters from his wife, who was going through psychiatric counseling. And she had been basically dealing with some sort of grief counseling. I was going through the stages of her grief, and you could tell from the novel that the novelist despised grief counseling. Didn't have the drama, didn't have the, the excitement of someone who gets excited enough to go out and kill somebody and then has to suffer the consequences. But again, that's the kind of mindset that deals in extremes. Would you like to be somebody who is constantly going through one extreme or the other? Part of the mind enjoys it. It makes life more interesting. But it doesn't really help in terms of finding a solid happiness. There's nothing dramatic about solid happiness. There's nothing dramatic about a sensible attitude that learns how to deal pragmatically with issues as they arise. That refuses to be blinded by extremes. That's when you learn to get past the romanticism and the drama and extremes. That's when you really get on the path. Your path practice really matures. You find that you have a tendency to extremes, and we usually 
don't have just one extreme in our practice. We go from one extreme to the opposite extreme, back and forth. You've got to find way, ways of modulating that. It means modulating both your physical experience at extremes and modulating your, your mental attitude toward them. I had a student one time who was manic and depressive. And she found that part of the problem, of course, was anticipating her ups and downs. And the anticipation in and of itself would exacerbate the problem. But she also found that her fit experience of the body was very different. And this is where the breath came in. When she was feeling down, she could breathe in a way that would add more breath energy, make the body lighter, lighter, lighter. So she didn't feel so weighed down all the time. And without the physical experience of being weighed down, her depressive mind states didn't have so much to latch onto. She began to cut through the pattern. Similarly, when she found that she was getting more manic, she would breathe in a way that would make the body heavier. She would think a lot about the earth element. Find whatever sensations in the body were solid, still, heavy, substantial. And just focus on those sensations, and that would balance things out. It would balance out the energy both in body and mind. So gradually the wild mood swings became a thing of the past. Her life wasn't as dramatic as it was before, but it was a more reasonable life, a more manageable life. That's the physical side. But there's also extremism in our thoughts. If it's not total sensual indulgence, it's total abstinence. And the mind looks at abstinence as, whoa, so it goes right into the indulgence. Without really there's a, realizing there's a middle way. There are sensual pleasures that are innocent, that are harmless. Mahagasapa, who is one of the strictest of the Buddha's monks, has verses talking about the beauties of nature, how much he enjoys getting out into the wilds. Apparently it's the first wilderness poetry in the world. And so even the strictest arahants have room in their practice for finding pleasures that are innocent. As he says, being in the Forest refreshed him. And the mind does need refreshing. We've got to find ways of dealing with its moods without giving into them. And realizing that you don't have to think in extremes. There are ways of enjoying some of the pleasures of the senses because they gladden the mind. That's one of the duties we have in the meditation. Look at the Buddha's instructions on breath meditation. When you find that the mind is getting down, its energy is low, you figure out ways of gladdening it. And part of that can be learning how to think about the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha in ways that you find inspiring. Anything that gives enjoyment to the practice doesn't get you all tied up. So it's not that sensual pleasures are bad. As the Buddha said, it's, it's not the beautiful things in the world and the nice things in the world. Those are not the problem. It's these obsessive plans we build around them. Then this is going to be really great. This is going to be really good. This is going to be worth whatever effort goes into it, whatever harm it may cause on the side. Who cares? This is what I want. That's the, that's the problem. A very unrealistic thinking about what sensual pleasure will do, do for us. That you've got to watch out for. For the pleasure that comes from a harmless activity, or an activity in which you're actually doing good for yourself and other people. It's not that the breath is the only way of finding pleasure in the practice. There's a pleasure in generosity, there's a pleasure in, the, in being virtuous. 
There's pleasure in finding time alone with nature. All of these are perfectly legitimate ways of looking for happiness, legitimate ways of gladdening the mind. It's the same with steadying the mind. If you find that your thinking is running away with you, you've got to figure out ways of just settling down, just being really, really still. So the extremes of your thinking don't pull you away from your center. It is possible as your thinking begins to follow from one conclusion to the next conclusion to the next conclusion, this is a problem of being logical but without reason, being reasonable, is it can totally pull you away from the practice. In Thailand they talk a lot about people who think a lot, and it's not a good thing. And so thinking is taken over. The logic is there, but without the reason. Reason is when you think about things with a sense of balance, a sense of proportion. So if you find your thinking running away, what ways do you have of just getting your awareness to be still, settled down, solid? Think of the Buddhist meditation on the elements, making the mind like earth, making it look like water, undisturbed by whatever it washes, wind undisturbed by whatever it blows away, fire undisturbed by whatever it burns. And you've got those qualities in your body, so whichever quality seems the best to make you feel solid and grounded, it's most often earth, but not necessarily. Work on that quality. This takes a lot of the drama out of life, but it's a much more sensible, reasonable way of living. The Buddha was nothing if not sensible. I mean, he'd explored all the extremes, and he realized that there was nothing there. His life story makes for great drama. The first part, at least. After he became Buddha, there wasn't that much drama. At least there's no emotional drama for him. But it was a much happier life. There was a cartoon in the New Yorker one time. This man sitting in his living room meditating. His wife was off in another room, looking in the door at him, together with a friend, and complaining to her friend was that George used to be such an interesting neurotic before he picked up meditation. It's one thing to be interesting, it's another thing to be happy, and another thing to be wise. So watch out for the extremes and the type of thinking that indulges in extremes. Because it drives you off the path. That phrase, having respect for concentration, the concentrated mind is solid, still, stable, extreme, extremely undramatic, but with a very strong sense of well-being. That's why it was the first factor of the path that the Buddha latched onto after he had explored all the various extremes. Here was a form of pleasure which was harmless. And then use that as your test case. Any pleasure that doesn't pull you away from this, that doesn't make it difficult for the mind to settle in. It can be something to energize you on the path. Any form of thinking that doesn't really pull you away from this, it helps you to settle in. That kind of thinking be part of the path. And you find that that kind of thinking makes a lot more subtle distinctions. It doesn't go running off after extremes. And 
know, there's some teachers who criticize idealism. It's not the idealism that's bad, it's the extremism, the absolutism. That's the problem. There are a lot of ideals that are really, really worth exploring, really worth following. John Munn, in his last sermon, mentioned it, the determination not to come back ever again to be the laughing stock of the defilements. He said, hold on to that determination. Never let go of that. And the determination is one that it is possible. Convince yourself it is possible to follow this path, to get results. Hold on to that. That's an, that's an ideal you never want to abandon. And secondly, that, that it is possible for you, and you're going to do it. You stick with that ideal, and then you find out whatever ex extreme forms of thinking get in the way of that, those are the things you've got to drop. Focus on what helps to get you to understand better and better exactly what are these defilements that are laughing at you. They pull you off into the extremes and they laugh at you. You go running back to the other extreme and they laugh at you again. It's when you're on the path that they can't see you. As I said, this is the path where Mara can't detect you. Mara can't see you. You're invisible. It involves a lot of skill. And there's interest in developing that skill. I mean, it's an interesting skill to develop. It may not be dramatic, but there's a strong sense of well-being and accomplishment when you have mastered it. That's what you're looking for.